So welcome everyone. This is the sixth installment of the ORCID US Community Showcase webinar series. My name is Sheila Rabin and I'm the program leader for persistent identifier communities at Lyricis, which includes our ORCID US community and our new Lyricis data site US community for DOIs. I'm gonna start us off today um, by giving a brief overview of ORCID and the ORCID US community. And then we will hear from Paloma Marin Araiza at ORCID with a brief global overview. And then our featured panelists will then give, uh, each will give a case study on how ORCID is being used at their institutions. So many thanks to our presenters. We have Yinteng Zhang at Rutgers University, Kelly Lockhart at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, and Iqbal Hossein at University of Arizona. And then at the end, we will wrap up with discussion and questions. Oops. Okay, so many of you are probably already very familiar with ORCID, but if you're new to ORCID or maybe you don't think about ORCID every day, um, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So we'll do a brief review. So ORCID stands for Open Researcher and Contributor Identifier. And an ORCID ID is a unique persistent identifier to distinguish individuals from each other. An ORCID ID is formatted as a URI. And if you were to click on the ORCID ID that you see here, you would be linked back to an ORCID record that can contain information about the individual's employment, education, works, funding, uh, other biographical details and contributions and activities. So what you're seeing here is an example from my ORCID record. And I want to note that ORCID is different from other researcher identifiers because it is not tied to a single institution or platform. ORCID is an independent, community-driven, nonprofit organization, and ORCID IDs can stay with an individual over the entire course of their career, despite any changes in name, institution, location, etc. And so ORCID is more than just name disambiguation, though. Um, the ORCID registry and infrastructure provides a mechanism for interoperability between systems and workflows in the scholarly communication ecosystem that require data about individuals, their affiliations and contributions. ORCID IDs are increasingly being used in funding, publishing, and research reporting workflows, not only to distinguish individuals from each other, but also as a time-saving approach enabling the transfer of data across the research and scholarly communication landscape. And the ORCID API or application programming interface is what allows organizations to read data from and write data to affiliated researchers ORCID records with the permission of the researcher. And this helps to reduce administrative burden in application and reporting processes. And it contributes to the integrity of the metadata in this scholarly ecosystem. So you can think of ORCID and the ORCID API like a central hub that researchers can use to store and share information about their affiliations and activities with the organizations that they work with. And then organizations can add information to individuals ORCID records so that the information is more authoritative. Now, because ORCID is structured like an ecosystem, it's really important that all of the stakeholders involved um, need to be active in order for everyone to get the most benefit. So for most institutions, including universities, but also um, other types of research institutes, publishers, funders, um, societies, and all, all the other kind of groups that are involved. Um, for most institutions, there are three equally important components needed to help both the institution and individual researchers benefit from ORCID. 
And those three components are um, gaining internal stakeholder support to prioritize ORCID adoption, integrating the ORCID API with local systems, and doing some outreach to educate researchers about ORCID so that they will get and use their ORCID IDs. And this is especially important because researchers are so central to the ORCID system. Now in the US, we have a national ORCID consortium for research institutions and other um, nonprofit organizations in the US. And our consortium is called the ORCID US Community. It was formed in January of 2018 when Lyricist, the Big Ten Academic Alliance, the Northeast Research Libraries and the Greater Western Library Alliance joined forces to form a national partnership for ORCID membership with Lyricist serving as the administrative home. We are also now partnering with the Health Research Alliance, which is a group of nonprofit health research funders in the US. And so as part of this partnership, my role is to provide dedicated technical and community support for all of our members, including support for advancing the goals of the ORCID US community, which include fostering a community of practice around ORCID in the US, establishing communication channels and enabling member institutions to share with each other. So for example, this webinar that we're having today and making it as easy as possible for institutions to adopt ORCID and really just making sure that member institutions are getting the most value from their ORCID membership. And currently we have 147 organizational members in the ORCID US community, and that number is steadily growing. Um, and so this map just kind of gives you an idea of where our various members are located. We do have mostly um, universities um, by far, but we also do have some uh, research institutes that are not universities. We also have some health and hospital systems. Um, we have some health research funders and we have some other um, just research related groups. So if you've heard of ESIP or the Earth Science Information Partners, for example, they are also one of our ORCID US community members. Um, so that's a little bit about the ORCID US community. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Paloma at ORCID um, to talk a little bit more about the global view of ORCID adoption and some updates um, that are coming up. Yeah, um, Sheila, I think you can continue sharing the same uh, presentation. Okay, great. And we just jump to the next um, slide. So as Sheila mentioned, my name is Paloma Marina Raifa and I work at ORCID and as an engagement lead. I'm currently working with several consortia since we've um, launched recently the consortia team. So um, in the United States, as <clears throat> Sheila mentioned, there are uh, from the ORCID US uh, community, 147 members. There is also another consortium embracing uh, mainly uh, government organizations, but in total, there are 257 members <clears throat> separated in different research communities, uh, research institutions, publishers, associations, government, um, service and technology providers or um, repository platforms and funders. And in total, there are 282 active ORCID integrations. Next slide. Um, if we think of the uh, Americas region, um, which is one of the biggest, uh, we've recently launched um, the uh, Colombian Consortium, uh, which has currently uh, 58 members, mostly universities, and they are all planning integrations in different systems. Um, so let's see how everything goes. There is another consortium in Brazil and another one in Canada. And we are working towards a consortium in Peru as well. And we have seven members uh, in Mexico and two in Chile. And the good thing in Mexico is that we even have the National Bank of Mexico planning to, to integrate with ORCID as well. Next slide. 
Next one, please. Yeah, here. Um, and in global, the global global picture, um, you can see here a map um, <clears throat> with uh, the countries where we have members colored, depending on the number of members. Of course, the US is the country that has most uh, more members right now. Um, and in total, we have 11.5 million ORCID IDs. Um, nine of them are a, a bit more than nine of them are active IDs. This means they have at least one work or one affiliation in general data. And we have over uh, 1,200 1, members and 24 consortia. And we have 984 integrations. And in the graph down below, you can see how those integrations are, um, are uh, distributed in different countries, being the United States, the one with more integrations, uh, followed by um, the United Kingdom and Italy. Next one. Actually, you can skip to the next one. Yeah, this is just my presentation. Um, and regarding data in ORCID, we know that there are several organizations that, that can't have a proper integration or a direct integration from their systems, but still want to push data to work records. Um, this is why we developed last year the Affiliation Manager, um, which pilot testing uh, is already complete, and it was released into production early this year and will be rolled out to the wider community at the very beginning of May. After that, um, Sheila as consortium lead will be trained and that affiliation manager can be offered to all um, consortia members. Next one, please. The idea is to be able, as mentioned, to push affiliation data to ORCID records. And this um, affiliation manager will be part of the member portal, which is an interface containing several uh, information from the organization. And all the features are going to be further developed uh, during this year and next year. And this um, graph shows a uh, workflow about how um, affiliations can be added to ORCID records through the member portals uploading a CSV um, file or even using the manual input, and depending on, of course, the size of the affiliate of the organization. Next one. And just an overview, this here and those here are the current numbers on of affiliations added by members and manually added by users. So our goal is to improve these numbers and have more assertion, um, more employment, uh, um, education, qualification, membership, uh, and service and invited position assertive data. And next one. And just a couple of new features we are planning in this context of adding affiliation data, the introduction of the raw registry, the uh, research organization registry ID to ORCID as well, so that we support Ringle, Grid, and Roar. We've recently introduced the credit roles for contributors, so that we acknowledge not only the participation of authors and co-authors, but also further roles in the production of works. Um, we are um, adding the relationship type funded by, which is particularly interesting for um, funders. And then we are thinking about implementing further features for OpenID integrators and uh, the possibility for researchers to proactively grant permissions to members. And those are um, features that, that can be checked and followed in that product roadmap that I've linked there. And that will be it from my side. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thanks Paloma. All right, so at this point, uh, I'm going to pass it over to Yinting. And if you wanna uh, share your screen, Yinting.
Thank you, Sheila. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yep, looks good. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yin Ting Zan. I'm the research services librarian at the Robert Wood Johnson Library of the Health Sciences of Rutgers University. And today it's a great pleasure to share our experience of uh, uh, implementing ORCID at Rutgers. I, I will cover briefly um, introduction to Rutgers University and uh, how we planned and implemented ORCID and what are outreach activities we had and what uh, where we are and what next steps we might have. So Rutgers um, University is a large public research university uh, with major academic and the clinical health sciences presence across the state. It was funded in 1766 and is the largest, oldest and top ranked public university in the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area. Rutgers is a member of the Big Ten Academic Alliance, in short, BTAA. The university is located in three New Jersey cities and they are New Brunswick, Newark, and Camden, with over 71,000 students um, from 50 states and over 125 countries, more than 8,700 faculty and, uh, and over 14,000 staff and over 1,200 international scholars from over 80 countries. And we are proud to say that Rutgers is one of the most ethnically diverse campuses in the nation. So why did we want to implement ORCID? As you know, name ambiguity is a big problem for researchers. ORCID ID provides a unique and a persistent digital identifier that distinguishes a researcher from others. ORCID ID connects researchers and their research activities throughout their career and through integration in major research systems, platforms, or workflows. ORCID helps ensure that a researcher's work is properly attributed and recognized. As an open community-driven and nonprofit organization, ORCID not only provides a registry of unique identifiers for researchers, but also an API that allows research communities to embed that identifier in research systems. And nowadays, funders, publishers, um, societies, and other stakeholders are requiring ORCID IDs. Publishers such as PLOS, uh, Taylor and Francis and others, they require ORCID ID in the manuscript submission systems. And NIH, ARC and the CDC require individuals uh, who are supported by research training, fellowship, research education and the career development awards have ORCID IDs beginning 2020. So ORCID is on our institutional repository, SOAR, uh, was connected with ORCID, any scholarly works deposited in SOAR, which stands for um, scholarly open access at Rutgers, could be poured into ORCID via data site. ORCID can also uh, help um, grant applicants and progress reporters to use data from ORCID in science CV to create bio sketches. So by implementing ORCID and it joining the BTAA ORCID consortium, Rutgers supports ORCID and encourages researchers and the scholars to adopt uh, ORCID and join the ORCID community. So here's the timeline of our implementing ORCID at Rutgers. In February, 2016, the um, University Senate voted unanimously yes for university-wide implementation of ORCID. And here is the picture to show that my colleagues, uh, Laura Mullen and Jane Otto were present as far as I remember. In May, 2016, Senate resolution was signed off by then university president. And very soon after the university uh, formed the implementation working group and then Rutgers also joined the BTAA ORCID consortium 
and formerly known as CIC Consortium, Orchid Consortium. So the soft launch of Orchid at Rut uh, Rutgers uh, took place in April 2016, uh, 17. Then uh, on half a year later, uh, and on October 18, the same year, Orchid at Rutgers was officially launched. So what's going on and ongoing is uh, we, our researchers continue to create and connect their ORCID IDs to net IDs. And the working group continues to explore and other potential integrations. The implementation working group was chaired by our university librarian and vice president for information services, Dr. Chris Allen Maloney. And the working group is comprised of representatives from uh, various stakeholders, um, Office of Research, Office for Research, formerly known as ORID, Office of Research and Economic Development, and then university libraries and uh, OIT and uh, IRAP, um, and the Office of Enterprise Risk Management, Ethics and Compliance, our Human Resources Department, and the School of Graduate Studies. While the um, implementation working team was busy planning the implement implementation, a subgroup was formed with the members from then RUL Research and a Scholarly Environmental Working Group. Um, the subgroup was charged in early 2017 to help plan, support, and promote Orchid at Rutgers. And mainly three members served on that subgroup, an open access specialist, who's uh, Laura, Mullen, and then a um, scholarly open access repository librarian, Jane, who's retired, and then me. Um, we, uh, uh, the subgroup worked very hard to, um, to help promote ORCID at Rutgers. And the activities that we launched included, but not limited to, um, we created uh, communication plans by working closely with the RUL Communication Office. Uh, we created a website for ORCID at Rutgers um, and that researchers can consult for any information they need on ORCID. We prepared brochures, handouts, tutorials, step-by-step -step instruction, boilerplate, and other instructional or promotional materials. We also provide um, brown bag sessions or train the trainers sessions for our fellow librarians or liaison librarians. Uh, we conducted presentations to researchers, research admins, and research development professionals. We also uh, conducted one-on-one -on -one consultations for researchers. Un answered, uh, we answered all kinds of uh, um, questions related to ORCID raised by faculty, students, and the staff. So recently, several training sessions have been conducted to researchers and research admins on how to use the data from ORCID in Science CV to develop NIH and the NSF biosketches for their grant applications and the filing progress reports. This screen shows a screen capture of what our ORCID at Rutgers website looks like. So it contains the several sub pages. The technical aspect of uh, integrating an um, ORCID was performed um, by the Officer of Information Technology. And the, our OIT folks um, added uh, an ORCID tab in the Rutgers Personal Information Application website. So when our users, researchers log into this personal info website, and they see this tab. And in the tab, there is this button called ORCID Create or Connect. And um, from here, researchers can uh, start registering for an ORCID account if they haven't got one, or they can connect an existing ORCID account. So um, they can display the ORCID ID in their personal info website after connected. 
And the OIT also integrated ORCID with uh, our CAS system, and that allows our users with the linked accounts and enable the single sign on to ORCID. So you don't have to remember all and, and different uh, uh, password and, and login information. Um, the, once connected, the ORCID ID is also displayed in the public uh, Rutgers online directory, um, and that will link to their ORCID profile page. This slide shows two uh, screenshots. On the left side, it's a screen capture from the personal info website. So you see the tab ORCID, and in this particular record, an ORCID ID is displayed because it, it is connected to NetID. And in under lower right corner, the screenshot shows the listing of um, uh, display of ORCID ID in the public listing of Rutgers. So what have we accomplished? What well, we have successfully integrated and implemented ORCID at Rutgers as planned as of today, um, there are 9,631 people regist who registered in ORCID with Rutgers email, um, but uh, only about half of them connected with ORCID ID. And this is far from our goal, which was like an 80% participation rate. So we need to work harder to get more people connected. And we also have on connected ORCID IDs that displayed in the public online directory, as I shown before. And in, uh, as I learned, integration with Pure was turned on. Somehow it was not used by researchers, probably due to unawareness of that. So where we are now, and then the, so. Um, many researchers uh, have connected their ORCID IDs, but as we just saw, only about half of them connected. Um, and uh, in 2019, we conducted a survey, just want to evaluate how successful that initiative was. From the 2019 survey data, uh, 730 uh, people responded, and among them, 57.4% uh, um, claimed, uh, responded that they registered with ORCID, and 46% of the 397 respondents have connected to ORCID. So you could see that's about like a, a little less of um, uh, fifty percent of participation rate. So there are many reasons for not connecting, and from the comments we received from that survey, and many say they don't know what ORCID is, and some were not convinced why they should want an ORCID ID and have it connected to Rutgers Net ID, and some indicated that they would need help. So we need need to uh, make more efforts to advocate and promote ORCID. And hopefully with more systems being integrated with ORCID and more researchers will be aware and, uh, and adopt ORCID IDs. So that's for my presentation. I will stop share. Wonderful, thanks Ying Ting. Thank and you. also, uh, everyone, don't forget that you can um, put comments and questions into the chat and we'll definitely address them um, towards the end. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Kelly Lockhart um, at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Thanks, Sheila. Let yeah. me go ahead and get my screen going. Okay, can y'all see those now? Yeah, looks good. Okay, great. 
Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I am Kelly Lockhart. I am a software engineer with the Astrophysics Data System, which is based at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Uh, there's lots of uh, logos at the bottom of my slide. So let me just give you a brief overview about what exactly all of this means. Um, so like I said, the project that I work on is the NASA Astrophysics Data System. Our parent organization is the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and uh, SAO is who our um, who is who the membership with Lyricis is with. Um, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory is in a joint institute with Harvard. Um, altogether, we're called the Center for Astrophysics um, here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's, uh, I think, the largest astronomy research institute in the United States. Um, currently, the um, Astrophysics Data System, or ADS, is the only ORCID integration here at SAO. Uh, we would like to expand that um, in the future. Uh, especially since we've joined Lyricis and we have lots more opportunities. Um, but for right now, I'm just going to tell you um, specifically about how we're using ORCID at ADS since we're the only um, real ORCID integration. Uh, so why are we using ORCID? So the ADS, I guess I should say this, let me go back a slide. The ADS is a digital library portal for astronomy and related fields. So physics and planetary science, uh, heliophysics. Um, it allows users um, who are mostly professional researchers uh, to search the astronomy literature. So you can search for journal articles, um, you can search for telescope proposals, things like that, and then actually access the full text of the paper. Uh, so you can access the um, publisher provided PDFs, you can access the archive open access articles. Um, we also have access to uh, proposal full text and things like that. Uh, so it's sort of a one-stop shop for researchers who are trying to access the literature. So for our users, uh, the most important part about ORCID is easy author name disambiguation. Uh, so of course, if your name is John Smith or you're trying to find a paper by a John Smith and you go search for John Smith, you're going to find way more papers than you're trying to look, uh, trying to than, than you need, right? Um, so with an ORCID, it's an easy way to distinguish one John Smith from another John Smith. Um, another thing that's useful for our users is a lot of times they're trying to maintain their own personal bibliographies. Uh, so if you need to provide a list of your publications when you're applying for a job, for example, um, you can maintain a hand curated list in a Word document, uh, but it's much easier just to give somebody a link. Um, so we have some tools built into ADS to let people make their own personal bibliographies, but uh, integrating with ORCID makes this much, much easier, especially as ORCID gets um, gets more widespread and people are, know what ORCID is and are using it for other things. Um, and then finally, um, as ORCID becomes more widespread, places like the NSF are requiring you to have a personal bibliography put together using ORCID. Um, so as more and more institutions start using ORCID, it sort of becomes like a snowball rolling down the hill. It just makes it easier. People already know what ORCID is. Um, they can use it in ADS, they can use it for their grant applications, they can use it for the job applications. Um, it just sort of creates this larger ecosystem. Um, so ORCID adoption at ADS dates back to about 2014, um, and it started really with encouragement from above um, for us. The American Astronomical Society is the um, national professional organization for astronomers, um, and also astronomy is sort of, I think, fairly unique in that um, our national society is also a major publisher, or maybe the major publisher um, in the field, at least in the United States. Um, so they run most of the major journals. Um, so it sort of helps that it's just like a one-stop shop. Only one group really needed to encourage ORCID. Um, and they actually funded the initial integration work um, here at ABS. They saw that ORCID was going to solve lots of problems both for us and across the field as a whole. And so um, they gave ADS some money to uh, start the initial integration with ORCID. Um, and that was completed um, in partnership with an outside software company um, over the course of a couple of years. And in 2016, we rolled it out to our users. And we've upgraded and maintained the system over the last few years. We upgraded to um, the second version of the ORCID API. Um, we also realized that our initial integration was not very fast um, or efficient, especially as uh, people really started using ORCID more. Um, I just looked it up and um, our user that has the most ORCID publications, or at least the most ORCID publications that they've claimed, um, has over 7,000 records. Um, so it's a huge ORCID profile um, and definitely was slowing down our system. So in 2018, 
Um, we went back and reworked our ORCID integration infrastructure to make it more efficient for, uh, for those users. Um, so now let me show you a little bit about what our ORCID integration looks like. So um, first off, let me say we have two main ORCID functions within our integration. The first is that we allow users to claim papers with their ORCID ID from within ADS. So, you know, of course you can go to orchid.org, you can fill in your profile, you can manually type or do the um, connect and link to, um, you know, find papers using their DOI or whatever. Uh, but we do allow people actually to do all of that same work from within ADS, which is where most of our users spend a lot of time daily or weekly anyway. So people can claim papers with their ORCID ID from within ADS. And we also allow people to search by ORCID IDs within ADS. So first of all, I'm gonna show you the um, claiming functionality. So this is the main search um, homepage within ADS. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just search for my own name. So I'm searching for papers that um, I was an author or co-author on. Um, and then here's the search results, uh, just listed in chronological or reverse chronological order. Um, the first thing I do is I turn on ORCID mode. So um, it's just a simple toggle switch. Um, one thing I'm not showing is I have already authenticated um, with OAuth. So I've signed into ORCID from ADS and linked those two together um, to say that um, I have an ORCID ID and it's fine for ADS to register my claims. So I just toggle that switch on. And then all of a sudden you can see that there's all these like green and gray bars that appear below, below the papers. Um, the green and gray bars just show that I've already uh, claimed these papers um, in my ORCID profile. So I've either um, claimed them using the ADS uh, UI or I've gone to orchid.org and claimed them there. That's just the difference in color. It's not a huge deal. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit and get to a paper um, here, paper number six um, that I have not yet claimed. And we'll just click on this claim in ORCID button right here. And what happens when I click that button is ADS behind the scenes collects all the metadata for the paper, packages it up, uh, ships it off to my ORCID profile um, and attempts to register it there. Um, assuming all of that goes well, ORCID responds back and says, okay, this paper is now officially on your ORCID profile. Um, here is your updated ORCID profile. Um, and then ADS on our side goes back and says, okay, cool. We've accepted that this paper is claimed now. Let me go ahead and show you a green bar to show that this paper has successfully been added to your ORCID profile. So at this point, if I went back and looked at my profile on orchid.org, this paper number six that I just claimed would um, already be there, would already be on my orchid.org profile. Um, cool. So that's the claiming functionality. But the thing that most people really care about is being able to search by their ORCID ID within ADS and find all their papers. So we can do that too. Um, so here, if you can see, I've changed my search and now instead of searching by my name, I'm searching by my ORCID ID. Um, all of the same papers show up, um, which is great, which is what we expect to happen. Um, a couple caveats here is the papers that I'm showing here, it's not just all of the papers that are on my ORCID.org profile. Um, we actually do a little bit of data validation. Um, so basically every night we have a pipeline that runs and it goes and checks for anybody that we have had register their ORCID ID with us. Um, so we maintain like an internal database of all of these like registered ORCID IDs. Um, we go through and check for anybody who has um, made some ORCID claims within the last like 24 hours or something like that. Um, for all of those recently updated users, we go and pull their fresh profiles off of the ORCID website um, and check and see which of their papers on their ORCID profile we know about. So like I said, this is an astronomy and physics um, digital library portal. We're not necessarily going to have like English papers, for example, or history papers. So if you are, uh, you know, a, a Da Vinci sort of person and have lots of pa papers across lots of fields, we're not gonna know about them. So we take all the papers that we actually know something about um, and we go and uh, start validating your claims. And what I mean by validating is we make sure that uh, your name matches the name of one of the authors on that paper. And we don't necessarily require that's an exact match because you know sometimes I may publish with my entire first name. Sometimes I may just use my initial, sometimes I use my middle initial. So we do some sort of fuzzy matching. Um, but we want to make sure that um, I'm not pretending to be John Smith, for example, 
Um, we do occasionally get bad actors who come in and just claim everything. Uh, so we don't wanna get sort of that junky data in our system. So we do some basic validation, make sure that my name actually appears on the paper that I've uh, claimed as mine. Um, we also do allow users to provide alternative names. Um, so if people have uh, changed their names, got married, got unmarried, whatever, and have published under multiple names, um, we do allow people to provide us with those alternative names so we can match on those, um, on those names as well. Um, so at the end of the day, only the uh, validated claims um, are searchable. Um, we also, I should say, uh, publishers, when they give us the metadata for their recently pu published papers, uh, publishers will also give us any ORCID IDs that have been submitted as part of the paper submission process. So if I, when I go and search for somebody's ORCID ID, whether it's mine or someone else's, um, the papers that are returned back to me are the validated user claims and also any um, papers that were provided to us by the publisher. So all of that is um, put together. And altogether, um, we index about 15 million records in total in AVS. And over a million of them have at least one ORCID claim on them, um, which is huge actually, because our um, database goes back to before the time of Galileo. So obviously some of that historical data is never going to have an ORCID ID on it. So the fact that 1 million of the 15 million records have at least one ORCID ID is, um, is a really great sign that people are, are starting to use ORCID, um, at least in our field. Okay, so that's our integration. Um, we do, of course, have uh, some plans for expansion. Um, we would love to make it easier for people to figure out what a user's um, ORCID ID is with, from within ADS. So right now, if I'm trying to go and find, um, find papers by somebody and I don't already know their ORCID ID, there's no way of finding that ORCID ID from within ADS. I would have to um, either get it from their own personal website or I go to orchid.org um, and look up their ORCID ID there and then come back into ADS and search for it. Um, so we'd like to do some improvements to make it easier to find somebody's ORCID ID from within ADS and sort of streamline that. Um, we also have some ideas for streamlining claiming papers. We would love to be able to suggest new papers for users to claim. So if um, a new paper um, is added to our database and we don't already have ORCID IDs attached to it, we'd love to say, hey, this looks like a paper um, that you've that is maybe yours, um, would you like to claim it with your ORCID ID? And on the flip side, um, if your name is John Smith, you're probably used to uh, filtering out lots of not John Smith papers that are not you. Um, so sort of an anti-claim, we've toyed with the idea of trying to figure out how to do that. Anyway, future plans uh, with things that we'd love to do in the next few years, but we'll see how far we get. And I'm sure we'll have lots more ideas as ORCID becomes more um, integrated within the community. And of course, we've had some time to do lots of outreach to try to con um, convince users to use ORCID. Um, and I've broken it up into um, both like internal and external outreach here. So internally, we have um, what I'm calling passive outreach. So of course, we have help pages. Um, we have an ADS blog that our um, users read. Um, so we have pages up on that um, to encourage people to use ORCID and help them uh, figure out how to, how to do that within the system. And then more actively, we attend conferences. We um, talk to people about the benefits of ORCID. Um, if somebody writes to us and says, um, hey, my name is John Smith, then everybody is, um, you know, it's really hard for people to find my papers. We're like, well, <laughs> do I have a solution for you? Let me tell you about ORCID. Uh, so that can be really helpful for convincing people to um, use and maintain their ORCID IDs. And then externally, I think honestly, this is where a lot of the outreach, um, really beneficial outreach has come. Like I said, the American Astro Astronomical Society is one of the major publishers in our field, and they've done a lot of the hard work about convincing people to use ORCIDs. I think at this point, if you submit a paper to them to publish, um, they require you to have an ORCID ID and they require you to provide um, ORCID IDs of your co-authors. Um, and as people start realizing, at least through the paper submission process, what an ORCID ID is, they start using it more. Um, same thing with librarians at re um, other research institutes encouraging people to use ORCIDs. Um, search committees are now requiring people to provide um, their personal bibliographies via ORCID ID. Um, and again, the NSF has been huge in this. Um, and finally, just lessons learned. Um, again, I think that this sort of carrot stick from above has been really huge for us. Um, you know, individuals may really see the benefit in using ORCID, but I think without that institutional buy-in, um, it, it's really hard to convince people to do this. Um, and then also integrating into the existing tools. Most astronomers, I sort of alluded to this before, but most astronomers use ADS uh, daily or most days, uh, we know from uh, looking at some of our uh, Google Analytics traffic data. 
Um, so the combination between the publishers requiring it and ADS making it very easy to use, um, I think has been big for a lot of people. And then finally, you really have to figure out how to reduce the friction for users. Um, I think especially uh, scientists who have been around for a while see some of these tools come and go. Um, and so if you want them to adopt the tool of the day, it really helps to reduce their friction um, to adopt it and then also provide encouragement, provide carrots for them um, so they can see why it's beneficial for them. Um, but yeah, um, I think that's it. And uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you, Kelly. And finally, last but not least, we're going to hear from Iqbal Hussein at University of Arizona. And do uh, just a reminder to everyone, as questions come up, do put those into the chat and we'll try to get to them at the end. And if for whatever reason you have to leave early or if we go over time, I will make sure to follow up with you. So don't worry about that. Iqbal, it's all you. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining. So my name is Iqbal. Today, I'm going to talk about EU Arizona Institutional Knowledge Map, KMAP. So I started this project as my postdoctoral research. And today, I'm going to talk about that. So we know that ORCID ID is perfect for identifying researcher uniquely. It helps to solve name disambiguation. It has API, easy to manage research records. All are good stuff. Now question is, what's next? So we are sitting in a big organization, big university, thousand of people. So a thousand of activities, what's next? So that is the next item is discovery and understand institutional wide knowledge. Now, what do, we, do I man, mean by institutional wide knowledge? For example, can we build multidisciplinary team based on research activities? So nowadays, when we write paper, we need to write a grant proposal. We need to involve with multidisciplinary people with the many skill and expertise. How do I? How do we find them? How do you visualize institute-wide collaboration? How do we understand the interdepartment relationship, connection, and the collaboration? So that kind of question, how do we visualize and understand research output? And then of course, research is one of the key items of, of the university, but there's a lot of other activities. How do we correlate other information with the research uh, output? So that kind of question, to answer that kind of question, we need to look back what are the data elements involved with this institutional knowledge? So, so in a university of or an institute, the main key element is uh, our researcher, faculty, students. So that's the main thing. And um, if we see all of the publication, cons consultanting, uh, job history, these are the things are related with the faculty's activities, researchers' activities. We know that there is a couple of different external profile like Google Scholar, ResearchGate, Orchid ID, those are the perfect working to managing all of the thing. But look at the, all of the other data, for example, um, courses, department, research area, research proposal, student, seminar, talk, um, news media, patent, discovery, um, disclosure, innovation, license, so sponsored projects. So all of these things are the huge lot of information sitting in the university Probably in a big university, we are managing all of the thing by different unit or different um, uh, department. So how do we get the, all the information and understand institute-wide knowledge? So if you, if you close your eyes, you will see that all piece of information is somehow connected through the researcher, through our um, grants or students or achievements or departments. So oh, this the thing connects. This is called institutional knowledge graph. So now, so what is the challenge to working on? It seems that all component of this thing is uh, known. So what are the challenges to work on that? So a couple of challenges. First challenge is, as I said, this is a located in distributed place managed by many different departments. How do we collect them? 
then once you collect it's a it's a whole lot of unstructured data semi structured data how do we connect them data to make the knowledge graph and then information extraction so this is another challenge is a whole lot of information how do we get information that we want and of course visualization you want to see that information in your skin so that is called complex high attributed graph network visualization that means you need to develop some kind of algorithm so that you can see what you want to see okay so now in university of arizona we actually collect connect and analyze those information also visualize that information we use natural language processing algorithm machine learning information visualization and graph theory to uh, to apply on those data and make a map like a geographic map so the next few minutes i'm actually going to show you how knowledge map at the university of at arizona look like so let me switch my screen here okay so this is the map it is a publicly available kmap.arizona.edu um, if we click on that so this is our map knowledge map so you see this is the department and if you start um, uh, zoom out and zoom on zoom in you started to see people are coming okay more people are coming so right here so this department actually is not random okay we measure how to how people from two department collaborate is other from the map i can tell that the department of mathematics and computer science they collaborate with other two mass than mathematics to physics because they are living far from the mathematics department that is the beauty of geographic uh, geographic um, data visualization so you, you 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 don't worry about some table it's more mass more complex than just table or uh, tabular data uh, visualization and, and data in, is in table so so this this map has meaningful now if you started to zoom in zoom in so right here so we put font name font size of the researcher is based on number of internal collaboration number of paper number of grants so all of these thing we use to understand the importance of researcher now now if you if you zoom in i started to see people if you click on that you see the more details about the people um, you can see here is this 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 researcher has orchid id you click there uh, this is the orchid id profile and then there's the other google scholar and university has uh, our own for filing system so we can visit there there's a list of grant list of publication you can quickly navigate you know, some publication as well so you 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 are able to explore all the search of university in the same place okay in the same um, same skin that is the beauty of kmap now if you click on the department so this is one department you see summary of the department now these are the connection we know that what does it mean collaboration network collaboration network if two people write the paper then they are collaborating but our collaboration network is much more stronger than that because we not only look the publication we look we we look grants we look research proposal we look uh, even rejected research proposal that is a we found that that is a great piece of information that tells their collaboration and um, and skill and expertise even that uh, some proposal had not funded yet okay or rejected so we look all of this information and extract that information extract that connection and visualize that in this way now so this is the base map once you have base map you have a lot more different opportunity to visualize more information on top of this map for example this is our funding so so this is um, funding from last few years you can easily tell that this is my most important people based on funding there is another guy let's look at this and um, you see so how easily you can see the whole information together that's the beauty of kmap now of course uh, you can scroll and you can uh, um, see that train what's happened you can correlate multiple piece of information for example this is a citation uh, the citation how this is where your important people lives 
Okay, uh, let me hide this. Yeah, okay. So those are examples we are working to create um, more um, overlay on top of the map. I want to tell you two more things. One thing, we have a great feature. We build a search engine to search from knowledge graph. What we can search, we can search some people, we can search some research topic. So for example, information, when I start typing something, it shows college, department, topic, grants are involved with the states and also people as well. So you can search people. So let's see, um, I click on information security and this, let me see this. Okay, so, so this is the information security research topic and these are the people who work on this information security and how information security actually connected with other things. I can tell that it's connected with the digital forensic, it's connected to data mining, network security. If I click on that, I can navigate as well for that topic. So all of these things is connected. So in the map, you can see all the people and department bus, but in the back, back in the scene, we actually connect all of this information. So not only this um, one topic, you can actually um, type multiple topic and hit enter. It looks all of the text. For example, I type um, see op optical signal processing and machine learning, and it looks all the text and find the result. And yeah, good. You can navigate um, the people department as well. Um, let me search National Science Foundation. Um, so this is National Science Foundation. You see, this is the people who got funded from National Science Foundation. This is the people who got funded from National Science Foundation. You can navigate and uh, NIH, um, NIH. So you see one thing is, um, this is the engineering people lives here, all of this department. This is, so this is the medical and other department, um, related departments here, yeah. You can search all of the other things. Um, now I'm going to show you the expert matching. So in expert matching, we design so that uh, you can put some long text, not only some few keywords, but long text like a call for paper or um, call for research proposal, um, or you have some abstract you want to find related people, or somebody is coming in your university wants to give a talk, you want to find a relevant people for that, uh, you can do that. So here is the text, some abstract, I'm um, trying to put it here, um, and search people. So, so this is fast and responsive. You see how quickly we can find the relevant people for the text. You can navigate the people as well, again, with the map for more details to see. And this is the collaboration, this is another interesting thing. This is the collaboration network for this specific text. That's, that means if you want to build some team and select some people, you might want to select a group of people because the, those are the people that's already connected. Okay, and some typical, uh, typical feature, you can filter some people, um, some position as well. So yeah, um, I will leave it here because 10 minutes is not really much for demo this game app. Let me, I have one more slide. So why do we need Orchid ID? So the reason we in, included Orchid ID is because we need more data about the people, okay? So KMAP is pretty new idea and innovative idea. People started um, to look the KMAP and um, it has a great impact for internal units and external university as well. So people look their profile and say, oh, hey, here, great, I am in the KMAP, that's great, but um, one of the uh, work is missing. So we tell that, hey, uh, please go to the Orchid ID, full, enter your work and come back and import your um, data in KMAP. That's one thing. Another thing is we are extending KMAP for cross university and, and that, that, that is how we're gonna use this unique identifier. Couple of challenges to work on KMAP and Orchid ID. We see that some of the people has uh, five different full, full um, profile and we handle um, to eliminate uh, duplicate data. Now some of the people doesn't have any profile at all. 
So that's the another thing because there's a lot of research or technical staff. They are great. They are great skill person, but they don't care about writing proposal, writing paper. Um, but in KMA perspective, those are also important people. So we tell them, hey, go to Orchid ID, create a new profile, and um, fill up your data and import your text here. So yeah, that, that is that is how we are um, using Orchid ID. Uh, I must need to stop. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me, Shelly. Wonderful. Thank you, Iqbal. Um, and thanks, everyone, for sticking around. If you do have to head out, uh, feel free to do that because we'll share the recording and we'll share the slides. Um, but if you can stick around, um, I think we did have a few questions. Um, and so just note that uh, here's our website and email address. We are on Twitter at US Consortium. Um, and uh, I'll get to our questions now. If you do have questions, uh, feel free to type those into the chat. Um, but basically, the first question is actually for Ying Ting at Rutgers. Um, which is, how did you do the outreach to get interest and support from faculty for ORCID? It, it seems like there was quite a bit of support that was generated. So people are asking um, how you how you did that. Oh, OK. Yeah, we um, um, reach out to schools, the departments, and also the Office for Research, but that time called the ORID. And we uh, got invited to present uh, uh, to the research development professionals. And these people work closely with their researchers in their units, their schools and the departments. So that's one way. And also uh, contact, you know, uh, the dean's office uh, or course directors. So any way that if we can find an opportunity, we would like to uh, seize it. Um, so I think that also library champions, you know, some faculty are very uh, pro libraries and then they can help spread the word too. Uh, our library directors also help, uh, you know, reach out. Wonderful. Thank you, Ying Ting. Um, and then there, there was another question um, just about, not necessarily for any of the uh, featured presentations, but about the ORCID policy of having researchers opt in. So for example, with the Rutgers example, um, only about half of the researchers actually connected their ORCID ID. Um, and so there was just kind of a question about why um, ORCID requires researchers to opt in instead of potentially um, already being connected and then opting out. Um, and I, I can certainly say a few words about that, um, but also I'm not sure Paloma, if you want to chime in on that as well. But basically um, in the early days of ORCID, um, ORCID was a, a originally set up so that institutions could create ORCID IDs for their researchers without having the researcher um, be part of that process. And that was piloted by several universities um, that just created ORCID IDs for all of their researchers. But it became apparent quickly that that was not necessarily the best approach because then the researcher needed to claim their ORCID ID and there were, it just created a lot of confusion. Um, and so ORCID switched over to a policy where the researcher has to create their own ORCID ID and um, you know, opt in to these connections. Um, because one way or the other, the individual researcher does need to be aware of uh, that, that it's their ORCID ID and we're talking about personal information. Um, and so that's also kind of a sensitive area around privacy and data sharing. Um, and so it is important that individuals know 
um, that they have an ORCID ID and they have full control over the information in their ORCID record. So it does create a, a need for um, you know, outreach and education to make sure that researchers know about ORCID um, and know how to use it. Um, but that, that need would be there no matter what, since we are talking about individual um, data. Um, and if, if anybody, I'm going to stop share because my um, Paloma, I didn't know if you had anything else you wanted to say about that, but I am going to put my email address in the chat. And if anybody wants to talk further about that, um, feel free to contact me also with any questions as well. Yeah, I think you explained everything correctly. And I'm checking right now the chat. I'm, I see that one person that I read disconnected asked for the, the roadmap URL. So I'm posting it here. Sheila, you will be the only one receiving the message, but then you can share that openly with oh, attendees that that's not a problem. That board is a Trello board and it's public. So everyone uh, should be able to to check and and see what's what's going on yeah okay great thanks paloma and actually uh one question came in for iqbal um for the kmap for university of arizona do you include teaching information um and if faculty co-teach um, so we are working on it. Um, recently, we started working on mining student to advisor communication message to understand whether whether a student is in risk or not. So a um, lot of time, student communicate with the teacher about uh, struggling or some trouble. So we're trying to understand that information so that uh, we can identify those students and um, help them better. Yes, we are working on that. Wonderful, thank you. I, I got a private message, but uh, private question, but I, I would like to tell you everybody that the question is whether there is any research paper on KMAP or not. So yes, so we have a couple of research paper on KMAP. Uh, please visit kmap.arizona.edu and then uh, publication, click on publication, you will be able to see our publication. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and I realize we are 10 minutes over, so thanks to everybody who hung around. Um, Sheila, I, excuse me, I got to yeah. direct a question too. Okay, somebody, yeah, asked, yeah, somebody asked if uh, students are able to connect their ORCID IDs to net IDs. Yes, because it's open to everyone, everybody, not just researchers. Oh, wonderful. That's great. Are there any other lingering questions out there? Okay, well, thanks again, everyone for joining us. Thank you all of our panelists uh, for presenting today. Um, please stand by, I will get this video recording loaded up and I will send out an email with the video link and the slides. So stay tuned for that and uh, we can continue the conversation. Um, you'll have everybody's contact information from the slides. So thanks again, everyone. Um, have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Sheila. Bye -bye. Thank you, Sheila. Yeah. Bye, bye, Kelly. I didn't get the chance to say hello and bye now. <laughs> <laughs> bye. No problem. Thank Thanks, everyone. Thank you, yeah, Sheila. Bye, everybody. Bye.